Good evening, everyone. This is Beth Sheffield uh, with the Greensboro Public Library, and welcome to tonight's program. We will be recording uh, tonight's program for view on YouTube. Uh, like all of our programs, this is a public program. Uh, we are here tonight to discuss uh, African Americans and the Oscars with uh, Dr. Frederick Goodeen Jr. and and his book, The Black, uh, the book, the Black Oscars. Uh, my name's Beth Sheffield. I'm the adult programming coordinator at the Greensboro Public Library. And I wanted to um, just thank those of you that are members of the Greensboro Public Library Foundation. It's because of the foundation that all of our programming at the Greensboro Public Library can happen. I also wanted to mention something that, you know, you have so many resources with your library card. Did you know that you can live stream, I mean, you can stream movies uh, on a service called Canopy through NC Live. So join us here at the Greensboro Public Library. If you're not a card holder, remember your library card is free. So we're so happy that you uh, can um, join us. So um, now, um, let's see. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ronald Hedden. Uh, Ron Hedden is our uh, library associate at uh, the Hemphill branch and the adult programming coordinator there at the Hemphill branch. You know him as a, a, a guru of many things. He is our book club uh, aficionado, as well as uh, uh, you want him on your trivia team for any any movie or uh, uh, music uh, thing. So, and does wonderful programming related to movies. So now it's my pleasure to to turn it over to Ronald Hedden. Thank you, Beth. I always love the great introduction you give me. Uh, sometimes I feel like you have more faith in me than I do in myself. But as you know, I truly love uh, what I do. Uh, I am so happy to be able to introduce Dr. Frederick Gooding, the author of Black Oscars from Mammy to Many, what the Academy Awards tell us about African-Americans. I thoroughly enjoyed the book and, and I'm looking forward to his presentation. Uh, Dr. Gooding is an associate professor within the Honors College at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Gooden critically analyzes race within mainstream media, effectively contextualizing the pragmatic patterns based upon their historical roots. As such, Dr. Gooden's best known work thus far is, you mean there's race in my movie? The Complete Guide to Understanding Race in Mainstream Hollywood, which has been utilized in high schools and universities nationwide. Also, the co-editor of Stories from the Front of the Room, How Higher Education Faculty Overcome Challenges and Thrive in the Academy. Gooding has stayed focused on the practical applications of equity within his 2018 book, American Dream Deferred, carefully detailing the growth and struggles of Black federal workers in the positive area. Dr. Gooding, welcome. And we appreciate you joining us this evening. Absolutely. Thank you, Ron. And thank you, Beth, for the scintillating introduction. I'm very pleased to be in the space and looking forward to this discussion. So quite simply, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the table, if you would, with a couple of thought concepts. I'm not going to tell everything in the book because that would defeat the purpose. We want you to go to your library, support your library and check out the book. Uh, but at the same time, we can still have a lot of food for thought for some conversations and some questions later on in the program. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can go ahead and get going here. So um, from the very beginning, I, I just wanna be very clear that while I indeed am critical about Hollywood and the Oscar system, I want to reassure everyone that I actually- <laughs> Everyone loves the movies. I mean, think about how movies in many ways have become this universal language. Um, you know, you can go many parts on our planet and connect with people who have seen the same movie, right? Not, not 
a similar version, but the same movie. It's a truly a universal language, right? And so uh, I just want to start off saying that I, because I love the movies, I spend so much time watching them and thinking about them. And so here's your ticket to admission to maybe an alternate perspective of what it is that is perhaps hidden in plain sight. So um, I'm going to structure my act along the lines of a traditional three act play or movie, right? Where you have introduction, conflict and climax and then some sort of resolution. So with respect to introduction, um, I think it's only fair and proper that we call upon an Academy Award winner or Oscar winner to help us get started on our training day, if you will. Okay, so we're all here voluntarily. No one put a gun to your head, I hope not. Um, and I am nowhere near as sinister as Alonzo Harris, this character in Training Day that Denzel won the Oscar for back in 20, um, 2004, right? Okay, um, but do be forewarned that we, when, whenever we talk about a movie, we're gonna talk about it. So spoiler alert, if you hadn't seen the movie, you may wanna put the mute on or something of that nature because we're, I mean, in order for us to analyze the movie, we have to talk about key salient points of the plot. So let's start at the very beginning. The name of the book is entitled Black Oscars, Colin. From Mammy to Minnie, what the Academy Awards tell us about African-Americans. Okay, but let's just start at the very beginning. Who is Mammy? Is there anyone in the audience who has a guess as to who Mammy is? You can either put it in the chat. Um, you know, I, I don't think we're able to speak to one another just yet. But yeah, I'm just curious, does anyone know who, who Mammy is? Have you heard of this character before? Hmm, 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 hmm. Let me see here. All righty, well, um, I think Beth is right about Ron's trivia prowess. Um, all right, very good. Okay, so we have a couple people adding on to, to Ron's correct comments. This is indeed the name of the character ascribed to Hattie McDaniel, the actress, in the movie Gone with the Wind. Now, I, I just wanna point out just a couple of details. Notice her name wasn't Sarah, comma, the mammy, Sarah Jackson, you know, playing the mammy. No, her, 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 the, the character's name was Mammy, right? And so I think that's important for us to observe with respect to her possibly being, I don't know, dehumanized, right? You know, not really being personalized, right? You know, the idea is that she was known for her function, which was to be a caretaker for this family as headed by, we you know, Scarlett O'Hara or Vivian Leigh, right? Who's a British actress, by the way, in, in one that same year. Okay, but what is correct, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Wavon is correct in that Mammy also refers to this larger generic idea of a black woman who is typically subjugated and was essentially built to serve, right? So Mammy was like this larger idea that, that came, um, you know, well, it was very much related to the era of enslavement and even, you know, the period following thereafter, right? As far as, you know, black women and their place in society. So that's Mammy, Mammy right? Maybe we'll come back to that. So the next question then is, and that was in 1939 when she won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress, okay? So who is Minnie? Ooh, ooh, hmm, hmm. Who is Minnie? Hint, Minnie is indeed a character name. No Googling, no Googling, right? But who is Minnie? Does anyone recall? Does, does Minnie sound familiar? It seems as a couple of us know a bit about Mammy, but what about Minnie? Hmm, they both start with M's, they both end with Y's, but there's something else going on in between. Man, okay. So Ron is headed out to Southern California it's for the Jeopardy tryouts after this, right? That, that, that's what's going on. That's what's going on. <laughs> okay, so Ron is correct. Minnie is the name of Octavia Spencer's character in the movie, the Academy Award winning movie, The Help. And she actually won the Academy Award for her role in 2011. So here's what we want to ask ourselves. What does this say? If black women are still winning Academy Awards, 
the highest, most prestigious award in the land, arguably, for playing maids over seven decades apart. What does that, what does that tell us about the status, the visibility and the value of African-Americans? Well, that, that's what we wanna explore. So some of you by now might be saying, well, I mean, come on, Dr. G. I mean, can you like, just lighten up a little bit? No, technically I can't, but the idea is can't you lighten up? Um, you know, it's just, it's just the Academy Awards, what's the big deal? Well, it may not be a big deal to you, but the Academy Awards is a big deal. As in, it's only the second most watched television program on the planet behind the Super Bowl, that is. So you're talking about 30 seconds would cost you roughly three to five million. No, it's a big deal. It's shown internationally in over 250 countries. It's kind of sort of a big deal. I mean, you know, think about it. Nobel Peace Prize is obviously very august and important, but it doesn't have the fanfare that the Academy Awards has, right? In terms of the red carpet, you know, just the whole ramp up. And think about how they announced the the uh, the, the nominees, you know, just uh, a couple of days ago, the, around the 15th. You know, it's like a month and a half, you know, leading up to the actual ceremony. And if you think about it, it's really a private ceremony that's made public. That, that, that's, that's what it is. I mean, we have no stake in it. We have no votes. Uh, we don't financially benefit. It's the industry putting it on for themselves, but they hold it publicly. We all celebrate in it, I guess. And it definitely has this impact, right? So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of these roles. I don't talk about the actors, I actually talk about the roles. I analyze the roles, okay? And um, the roles that you find that are Academy Award nominated fall under a pattern. A pattern that I go into more detail in this other book. You mean there's race in my movie? All right, I promise I wasn't gonna be sinister and threatening like Alonzo Harris, so let's move on. So, but I'm not here to talk about that book. I'm here to talk about this book, right? And essentially, um, just as the, when you look at the base of the Academy Awards statute, the Oscar, it actually has five reels. You see those circles down there at the bottom? bottom? Those are five reels, which are meant to symbolize the five original branches of filmmaking. Right. See, most oftentimes when people are holding an Oscar up high, you, know, you never see the bottom. They never do a close up. But somebody had the opportunity to actually hold an Oscar when they went to the Academy, uh, uh, the, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences out in California to do research. And I can tell you that they're, they're, they're actually pretty heavy. Right. You know, I mean, you know, yeah, they're, they're pretty heavy. But but when I was holding it, I, I looked and I was like, hey, what's this? Right. You know, I'm just inquisitive. Right. I'm, I'm just critical thinking like that. Right. And so then I explained it to me. So I thought, I said, Eureka, this is perfect. And so essentially what it did is it gave me this rubric, well, the, that inspiration for a rubric by which to categorize these patterns that we find with these Academy Award winning, um, Academy Award nominated and winning actors and actresses. And so they're called the five black Oscar angles. I will explain them in a bit more detail in a little bit, okay? I just also wanted to previews to you that uh, I, I have a fetish for facts. So I believe in data. Um, you know, in addition to feelings, I believe in data. And so I actually have the data on what the winners are in terms of nominees versus the actual winners, okay? But hold on for that as well. I mean, again, I mean, what's a movie if you don't build up any suspense? So, so y'all gonna have to wait a little bit. Okay, so in the meantime, what are we gonna talk about? What we're gonna talk about is the difference between quantity and yeah, yeah, I think you see it, see it on your screen, that big orange word, quality. Because when we talk about data, it's definitely a means to measure diversity. But what I suggest to you is, is that it's an imprecise means. It, it, it tells part of the picture. And so I'm not so much interested in, oh, look, there, there's three African-Americans in this movie. Awesome. I'm, I'm, in addition to that, I'm also interested in the quality of their roles. Right. And so in order to help us along, I, I chose three movies with a recent memory that were Academy Award nominated or Academy Award winning uh, roles to help us parse out this larger idea of quality. And then I'll circle back to the Black Oscar angles and the data. OK, and, and then we'll maybe have some conversation from there. OK. 
So what did I miss? What did I miss? Mm. Oh, oh, okay, one more detail. So before we go into this quality discussion, qualitative analysis, shall we say, I uh, just wanted to point out one little detail. And that is Hollywood began with racism. I, I, I don't know how else to explain it to you. It's, you know, I mean, I think it's a factual statement. I mean, after all, how about this? If you don't believe me, I mean, let's just look at the facts. Does anyone know the name of the first movie? Well, not the first movie, but it's considered to be the godfather of mainstream movies. It came out in 1915, and it pretty much is known as the archetype for our modern movie experience that we, yeah, very good, Stacy. Very good, Renee, Birth of a Nation. And so again, Maybe we can talk about this in Q&A. If you all disagree with me, obviously it's a free country, you're free to disagree. But um, the idea that the KKK literally rides in on horses to save the damsel in distress from a black male who actuality is a white man in blackface, that qualifies as racist. Or how about this? What was the first talking picture? Does anyone remember this? 1927? 1927, the first talking picture ever. Because remember, these are historical pieces. If you go to any film school worth the salt, they're going to show and screen these movies today, right? Okay, y'all are with me, the jazz singer. And again, this storyline here is you had a Jewish cantor that meant that his family wanted him to sing you know, for his religion, you know, you know the, the Torah, the, the first half, you know, he's supposed to sing it in the synagogue, but the idea is that he wanted to make it in show business. He, he really wanted to express himself as a minstrel, right? And again, I, I don't know if they're being tongue in cheek or whatever, but look, look at the line at the top of that, that, that video box and glory is black and white. Oh, wow. But yeah, this would be considered racist. I mean, no, if you want to sing, that's fine, but just sing. Why do you have to paint your face and burnt cork and paint on elongated and exaggerated white lips to imitate a black person? I mean, if you want to sing, sing, but why do you have to exaggerate and make fun of a black person while doing that? That's, that's called racism because of power and control at that time. Power and control. But I'm, I'm not trying to get into that. I'm a historian. You know, we can get into that later. But the bottom line is racism was at the root of Hollywood's very beginning, okay? And um, I just want to also point out that if you see that little M at the top, um, this idea of race is still an ongoing issue. Um, this is the logo of Maria Montessori School in Utah, where um, just last month, the parents, it's a private school, it's Montessori. It's like child-led, child-directed, right? You, know, you have to pay for that. You have to pay for your child and choose what they want to do, right? So at any rate, the point is, um, the parents at Maria Montessori opted out in Black History Month. And again, as a historian, you know, I'm, I'm just really a bit perplexed over how you go about telling the story of American history <laughs> without <laughs> incorporating or invoking African-American history. I don't know how you tell, tell the story of how you know, one of the greatest, you know, strongest nations on the planet was created with an economy that didn't pay people for a quarter of a millennia, right? Nearly 250 years. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how, you, you know, the Civil War and, you know, just everything after that, from failed reconstruction to Jim Crow to, you know, neoliberal. Um, I, you know, I just don't know how you can opt out of Black history. So but the point is, y'all, it's still an ongoing issue. So our issue today is to figure out through the lens of movies, what do we see? Okay. So... Um, if I were to ask you, like, when did this racism, if it was a train that left the Hollywood station back in, say, 1950, when did it get derailed, right? If I were to ask you, I'm sure I see a number of different dates, and, you know, there wouldn't be one date that we would necessarily agree upon, right? You know, and so what we want to ask ourselves is, um, has racism evaporated over time, or has it evolved, right? And so, think on that while we transition.
to act two. Okay, so why don't we do this? Why don't we take a look at those three movies I previewed earlier? Maybe that will help us out in terms of this discussion and making the determination as to whether racism has evaporated or evolved, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show a short clip of, from a very powerful scene in the movie. Again, spoiler alert, if you've seen this, uh, haven't seen this before, it's a key scene. All righty, so um, I'm just curious, are there any um, reactions that you all could put in the chat in terms of why, why you think this scene is so very powerful? Why, why do you think I chose this scene to, to, to show? Um, you know, what, what resonated with you? What were, what were some of the emotions or thoughts that you were feeling as you were watching this? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Because um, I, I know how I felt, when, you know, when I saw this scene, right? And again, this is from the recent movie, Hidden Figures, right? Um, Octavia Spencer and Janelle Monáe and... Um, uh, Taraji P. Henson. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was just curious whether, it, you know, it, Ron says dramatic, even though it's not true. I mean, man, um, that sounds kind of harsh, only because is correct. Uh, powerful scene, entirely made up. Hmm. Remember, we're talking about quality, right? Quality. Hmm. So let's just think for a little bit. What does this say? If a movie, arguably about three black women, I mean, the the the, 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 the name of the movie suggests that these women have been overlooked, right? Hidden figures, and so therefore, what we're doing is we're bringing their voices to the screen. We're um, showcasing uh, their, their, their stories and, and highlighting their, their effect and impact. But yet, why is it necessary to fabricate white heroism? Why, why, why is it necessary to do that? Well, because maybe Hollywood is concerned that if you don't have what I call in the book, a white anchor, right? Kevin Costner, a look actor, a list actor, you know, widely recognizable. So if he's doing something in combating justice, then oh, okay, then that means it's legit. Now I'm on board. And so in other words, the insertion of the scene, the complete fabrication of the scene suggests that the voices of the black woman are not strong enough. Let's move on. Speaking of voices, let's look at the help, okay? Um, so the author of the help, Catherine Stockett, uh, talks about how the protagonist, Abilene, is a heroine, right? And the reason why is because uh, she's intelligent, an author, and a devoted servant of the Lord, in addition to being a good mother. But I guess my question to you is, is good mother to who? Like Abilene, that, that, that was the character played by uh, Viola Davis. Who, who did we see Viola Davis being a good mother to? Hmm. I'm, I'm just trying to think. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Let me think. Hmm. Who do we see her being good mother to? Because what's fascinating is when you think about the children, the black children. Um, we actually didn't never saw Viola Davis's child because um, it was a sad story. Apparently, his, or her her son died uh, prematurely, right, due to an accident or a misfortune. I can't recall exactly what it was, but he died. Uh, we never saw him. And then you look at Octavia Spencer's Minnie's uh, daughter, and we see Minnie preparing her daughter for a life of servitude, right? You, 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 know, you know those coming of age movies we, we like to see, like, uh, like I, mean, I don't know, like maybe even like Star Wars, where like a young Anakin Skywalker at the age of five can like trip and find himself in the way of an X-Wing fighter. And then by D deductive reasoning, talking through with RTD2, he's able to fire off the, 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 the photon torpedoes and destroy the Death Star. Like, wow. So compare, compare the fantasy that's available, or, or, or even like if you look at a, a movie like, you know, like Jurassic World, where you have teenagers in a, gyro, uh, a rotating gyroscope with dinosaurs roaming all around them, this idea of fantasy and liberation and freedom and ideas 
And meanwhile, this black teenager is being coached and taught on how to clean up after somebody else. Hmm. But okay, but let's go back to Viola Davis's character. So that, that's the motherhood that we saw, right? You know, and, and here's the thing. The Help was a feel-good movie. It was meant to bring audiences together and, and make them feel good. But I, I guess the question is, but, but I guess who did The Help really help, right? Because um, what's fascinating is uh, it really didn't help me. Like, I, I didn't need to see The Help. It wasn't informational. It wasn't educational. It wasn't interesting. Because, you know, I heard stories from my great aunt who told me what it was like on her knees cleaning up a toilet with a toothbrush, right? She, she, she told me these stories. Like, it wasn't glamorous. I mean, so I, I, I didn't rush to the theater because it was interesting, right? You know, I, I, I already have black women in my, in my family who had to go through this type of subjugation and it wasn't glamorous. And what's fascinating is even Viola Davis herself regrets her role in the help. She just felt at the end of the day, the voices of the maids weren't heard. And speaking of the voices, I mean, I think she might have a point in that, um, I don't know about the movie you saw, but the movie I saw, uh, Skeeter, as played by Emma Watson, well, I'll get to that in a second, um, in the next slide. But, but here, here's a, you know, I, I think just a simple exercise for us to think about. Going back to the, the pie that Ron had uh, alluded to earlier, the terrible awful, let's just actually logically walk through the terrible awful, right? How does she make it? What was baking like? What happened to the baking tools? What were the ingredients? How does she procure the ingredients? You know, I mean, when you actually logically think about it, because for those of us who don't know, the terrible awful was essentially a pie full of fecal matter, right? And so she baked this fecal matter. But I mean, I, I don't know, y'all. I mean, on one level, I guess it was a way to give comeuppance to the racist, the evil hilly. Um, but for me, it, it just appears a bit juvenile upon reflection. For me, it appears to maybe cheapen the true creative advocacy, the agency that so many black women had in terms of navigating these spaces. Because it is true that 80% of black women worked as domestics in the South because there were simply no other jobs available, right? Especially before World War II, right? Before the US, you know, Uncle Sam needed bodies, right? So 80% of black women are just same game, different name. Even though technically you're free from slavery, you're still not equal. The only thing you can do is pick up after me and work for me 24 seven, right? And then maybe go home and try to feed your family. And if you don't believe me, check out the Pulitzer Prize winning book from the library, Warmth of Other Sons, where Isabel Workerson uh, documents the horrors of you know, black women who left the South to go to the North looking for a better life. And you know, oftentimes, you know, discover that hashtag me too would have been helpful, right? Because so many black women were preyed upon, preyed upon in these environments. It wasn't glamorous, you know, and, 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 and that to navigate all that and still have the wherewithal to raise families. I mean, see, because those are the shoulders I stand on, right? Those are the shoulders I stand on. And so if you're telling me that the only way that they could fight the power is by taking a dump, and adding butter, vanilla extract, and eggs to it, I, I just think it just cheapens the process about what true advocacy is truly what, what, what it's about. You know, I'm, I'm trying not to get too serious. I know it's just a movie, but at the same time, right, we're, we're talking about how many people are dependent upon these movies. Many people don't take the time to go to the library and read up extra books or, you know, we think about our history courses in terms of, you know, how much material they go into detail about the horrors of the, you know, of, of our darker chapters. They're embarrassing, so oftentimes we avoid them, right? And I'm just going off of the students that, that, that I teach. They're well-trained. I'm talking about average 1400 SAT, 31 ACT, smart as a whip, but they have no knowledge. They're smart, but they have no knowledge, right? Because it's not something that we do. Not to mention just even in the, uh, the bonus scenes, the, 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 the added detail about how the black male was like actually the uh, source of physical abuse. So we're not even gonna get into that right now. But what I was gonna say earlier was the movie that I saw actually featured Skeeter, Emma Watson on the left-hand side, who uh, was able to get a job, was able to, uh, through persuasive argument, leverage um, a, you know, a, an advice column 
and then was actually able to leverage Abelene's advice in the advice column for a book deal, right? So she used Abelene, you know, the first time and then leveraged the stories of all these black maids for, a, you know, an opportunity to move on to New York. In the meantime, she reconciled with her mother, reconciled with her love life, um, you know, in terms of at least getting a situation straight. And she was able to leave the state of Mississippi. So when you look at Emma Watson's character arc, it's phenomenal in terms of all that she did and how she transformed. Meanwhile, the movie that I saw, while it's hinted that Abilene Viola Davis was to be an author, we never saw it on screen the way we saw it with Emma Watson, okay? They both, their last scenes on screen were in maid outfits, right? Remember, I, in Minnie's character, we're supposed to be happy because she's sharing fried chicken cooking duties with her mistress. So the question is, okay, after they sit down and eat that meal together, who does the dishes? Or how about the next day? Who's going to cook the chicken then? So the bottom line is she's still a subjugated maid, but for some reason that scene is supposed to make us forget and, you know, and everything's all good. So it's possible to see the same thing, but not see the same thing, right? And, and this goes back for a very long time, a tension between, you know, white feminists and another feminist color, this idea that, you know, when you say feminists, you know, many white women, you know, might oftentimes exclusively see themselves in the picture, you know, at the expense of other women of color. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper talked about this over 100 years ago, 150 years ago. You, you, you white women speak of rights, I speak of wrongs. Okay. Speaking of starring, I just want to quick, take a quick detour really quickly before we talk about the third movie example. And I just thought this was fascinating. Um, speaking of starring who, I don't know if you want to saw the movie Soul, but again, spoiler alert, I'm about to tell you what's, what happened. The movie is the, supposed to be the first animated movie featuring a black protagonist. Because remember, Princess and the Frog was cell animation drawing, much like the older Disney movies like Cinderella, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, et cetera. It was cell, it was cell drawing. So this is animated, you know, like, like Toy Story, you know, uh, Brave, Tangled, those movies. But if you notice about those movies, particularly with Brave and Tangled and others, they feature teenage protagonists. So I think what's fascinating is this is the first protagonist of, of, of a you know, male, black male color and he's a 40 something year old jazz middle school teacher. Okay, that's interesting. Not only that, but he dies in the first third of the movie. And then <laughs> he's trying to get back to earth in his body, but he makes it back into the body of a cat. It is Tina Fey who actually is occupying his body. And when he's in his actual voice, What's funny is he's this blue character that I'm, I'm about to point out to you. And here, here's my point, right? Some of you may think that, but it's just a movie, Dr. G, lighten up. First of all, I told you I can't lighten up that easily. But the second part is people used to make fun of my nose and lips, right? When I was growing up, there's a sore point, right? You know, and also when you look at many of these uh, unflattering uh, political cartoons um, that we may call racist now, it's always exaggerating the size of the lips of black people, things of that nature. Now, when you look at the, the, the Kylie Jenner package and the Kim K treatment, it's now an end thing to do, to have a fattened lip and, you know, when you, you know, right, when you're taking the internet, when you're taking, the, that now it's like a cool thing to do. But back in the day when I was just a young black man, you know, it, it wasn't, and, and people made fun of my lips, right? But what's so interesting is when we look at the movie, when Jamie Foxx is his voice, magically, I, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to see right now. You know, I, I don't have my contacts in, but I don't see his nose or I, I can't see his lips. And, and that, you know, it's just interesting. I, I can't, maybe, maybe in, in the movie that you saw. The last thing I'll say is, I think what's so very fascinating about this is this was actually the subject of a horror movie back in 2017, right? When a black body would be dispossessed of its own consciousness in favor of a, a white visitor. And that's exactly what happens in Soul. And if you watch the movie Soul, it is Jamie Foxx who is selfish for wanting his own body back. And so therefore he sacrifices it. Now, for those who saw the movie, within the last 15 seconds, he's given that opportunity to get his body back as a result of his sacrifice. But still at that point in time, he had made the sacrifice. And it was he who was wrong for wanting his body back. And that's the subject of a children's movie in 2021. It's just fascinating how this changes. Okay, back to the program. 
So going back to the quality of roles, let's go back and look at this third clip from the Green Book. Okay, as you watch this clip, I want you to ask yourself the question, who is driving the action? Okay, so apparently Marshall Ali wins an Academy Award because he's lectured by a white middle-aged male about how the white male is blacker than he is? Okay. All right, all right, all right. So, so maybe you all can explain it to me in, 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 in the Q&A. Here's what's also fascinating. Oh, but Dr. G, there's a power dynamic. Dr. Shirley, uh, the black character was actually in charge. You know, the white male was actually driving him around. Yeah, I guess you're right. Up until a point. Because what is fascinating is how this dynamic, this power dynamic was reversed at the very end of the movie, right? Because for those of us who saw the movie, it was actually Dr. Shirley who was helping Viggo Mortensen's character, you know, uh, repair his family dynamic. You know, he, you know, he was the voice behind the letters, et cetera. And it was actually a Dr. Shirley who went to Viggo Mortensen's home to celebrate the holiday. So, so again, well, you know, we asked the question, well, who's the movie actually starring? Who's the movie actually about? I think there's a fair argument that the movie you know, it was just about much about the white character and his family dynamic and his character arc as it was about Dr. Shirley's, right? You know, and, and so what's ironic is Dr. Shirley actually drives the white male home, you know, at the end of the movie, right? Um, so power is not necessarily absolute in that respect. So what does this mean, right? What does this mean? Let's try to resolve this a little bit. So what? Um, just very quickly, um, I just want to remind everyone that um, Hollywood is indeed a big business, right? We're talking about 150 million on average to make a movie. And that's not even counting the 30 million on average to market and produce a movie. We often overlook how movie ads are ubiquitous from bus stations to uh, you know, fast, fast food tie-ins. This is one of my favorites. This is a train station out in California, right? Out in the Oakland area. I mean, look what they did to the floor to make it look like the, the ocean and how they painted the ceiling to look like the sky. All for Pirates of the Caribbean part 14, right? Utterly amazing, right? Let's not also forget that movies have a global impact as I was alluding to earlier. Movies are only the second leading export behind aircraft. So even though you may not have been to Vietnam, American movies have been there. You, you may not have been to Australia, but American movies have been there. You know, and you may not have been to the Czech Republic, but American movies have been there. Uh, not to humble brag, but I've been to all three places I just mentioned, and I've gone to the movie theaters all three places, and guess what? I actually saw more American movies at those theaters than I did from, lo from local cinemas, right? From local industries, right? So. You know, the question is, what are people seeing when they, when they watch our movies, right, in terms of our dynamics? You know, and then lastly, movies have an unparalleled shelf life. Film is forever. You all recognize this movie. Isn't that fascinating? So many of you recognize this movie. Never met me before, but you recognize this movie, right? Miracle on 34th Street. Film is forever. And it's been on every year since it came out in 1947 and probably will be for 100 years hence. I, mean, I don't see what would derail the train anytime soon. But guess what? The movie didn't have anybody like me when I saw it as a kid. Doesn't have anybody in the movie like me when I saw it as an adult. And probably won't have anybody in the movie who looks like my granddaughter when I watch it, you know, a few years hence. Right. But it's, that's just the way it is. And it, the movie is part of Americana, but I'm not a part of it. Right. And so in terms of going back to where we started, a final uh, Oscars analysis, not really much to talk about. I mean, just the numbers are low. I mean, maybe we all knew this instinctively, but I mean, here, here you're able to just see it, right? That's why I didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. It's just not too much to talk about. I mean, 0.2%, what, I mean, what are we supposed to talk about, right? You know, same thing with the wins. I mean, 0.2%, what, what are you so I what I think is a little more interesting is this idea of the Black Oscar angles. So let me explain these in turn. So Black, not American. What this means is that nearly a fifth of all Academy Award nominated Black actors are not from America. So here's the deal, y'all. I'm not hating on anybody. Like say, say for example, Cynthia Erviel, right? You know, she was in Harriet. Uh, power to her. I'm glad she's able to, to feed her family and things of that nature. All I'm saying is, this speaks to the paucity of opportunity for Blacks here in America with respect to Hollywood, right? I mean, think about this, right? Because what you're telling me is that you can't find a Black American actress in the streets of, you know, of LA to, to play Harriet Tubman 
an American hero and Harriet Tubman, you can't find a black American actress. So it speaks to the lack of opportunity. So what's fascinating is how many, um, you know, they, they're from the black diaspora, you know, whether it be from the islands or, you know, from the, the motherland continent or from the, you know, UK, but the idea is they're not from America, right? You know, in terms of the American Hollywood industry is where it's based. Hollywood is based in California and America, right? Um, crossover. So here we're looking at um, all your black movie stars are not necessarily classically trained actors, right? And so this is Hollywood's uh, shorthand way of cheating because you get two for one. So rather than take the time to build up an A-list actor, think about Tom Cruise. He didn't jump out of the room as an A-list actor. Yes, he likes to jump on couches and late night talk shows, but he didn't jump out the womb an A-list actor. He was built up over several projects over several years. But what we're saying here with the crossover is, I need to be an internationally known comedian like Chris Rock or Chris Tucker, just so I can garner a role. Or I need to be a platinum selling you know, a, a artist just so I can get a role, right? So what does this mean for those who actually have dared have dreams about just being an actor and actress and making it in Hollywood? It's all the more difficult, right? Because of name recognition. Deja vu, this speaks to this idea of, we've seen these actors and actresses before. Uh, two out of the three movies that I profiled featured the same actress in uh, Octavia Spencer. So God help us all if Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, and Viola Davis all get in a car accident. They'll, they'll be half our nominees right there. Half, right there. God forbid. So, you know, we have protocols where they cannot ride in the same car at the same time, okay? Gravity reality. This essentially speaks to this idea that black, whenever you see black people on screen, eight times out of 10, they're either poor or impoverished or suffering from racism, right? And so th this speaks to this idea of how many black images are limited in that respect, right? And, and you know, again, remember we talked about the whole dinosaurs and things of that nature? No, no, no. It's always, you know, oh, and how are we gonna pay rent? And oh my Lord, and you know, police brutality. And not to say that those things aren't real, but think about how on a Friday night, Many of us like the idea of escapism. We like the idea of fantasy and going to a faraway place, right? As opposed to dealing with these realities. That's the gravity of reality, right? Think about this commercial. The power of imagination. The thrill of adventure. The journey will be electric. The Chevy Bolt. I mean, this is just a simple car commercial. But think about the element of fantasy, really? Like there's an X-Wing fighter, fighter flying A, that close to the ground, and B, that close to their car. I mean, so oftentimes we often overlook how so many of my white brothers and sisters are afforded what I call the freedom of fantasy, right? But when it comes to black indigenous people of color, it's always this gravity of reality, right? And then finally, um, still in the struggle, nearly a quarter of all your black Academy Award nominees die before the, 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 the roles die before the end of the movie. So, is it a big deal? You tell me. I will tell you this though, Hollywood can't have it both ways. For those of us who saw, speaking of fantasy, for those of us who saw the movie, Ted, Ted was about this animated talking foul mouth teddy bear, supposed to be funny, you know, take one and cuddle teddy bear. And there was like foul mouth and things. Like uh, Seth MacFarlane, the family guy creator, he's the one who was behind this. So the teddy bear gets ripped apart towards the end of the movie. And the girlfriend feels remorseful, played by Mila Kunis. And she wishes for the teddy bear to come back to life. When she wishes, she looks up at the sky and for a few brief seconds, it wasn't like part of the plot. It was like a few brief seconds, they showed the constellation, Ursa Minor. And yes, party people, for those of you who keep the score at home, Ursa Minor means small bear. So the question is, which one is it? If Hollywood is so detail oriented to make sure they get right a constellation, you mean to tell me you have no idea what's happening with the quality of these other images? So here they are, all 19 of your Black Academy Award winners to date, right? We, we don't know how this will change on April 25th. Maybe there'll, there'll be a, another one. But I, I think what I want you to look for is to what degree is this pattern still alive? So far from what I've, uh, you know, and I haven't studied it, I, 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 but from, so far from what I've seen, most of the, the nominees featuring Blacks are in these type of roles we've been talking about as far as the gravity of reality, right? You know, so, you know, it'd be curious to see who the 20th winner will be. I mean, as you scan, just, you know, looking across these movies over the years, you know, just think about the quality of these roles and whether any of these roles challenged substantively 
the power dynamic between black and white power relations in society, right? In society, right? As opposed to blacks being known for, you know, caretaking, helping, as opposed to them being their own strident, you know, her heroes and heroines. So when we look at Manny to Mimi, we have to ask ourselves to what degree has that racism train stayed on track, but just with a sleeker look? I mean, it's, it's a question, right? Um, you know, um, to what degree is it still moving, but just quieter, more efficient? It's not nearly as noisy and it looks better, right? In terms of the same ideas, that's what we wanna ask ourselves. Because in closing, this is what we're talking about, right? I think the, the, the new thing we should consider is, you know, back, back in the 60s and 50s, right? I think the issue was physical segregation. And, and that still maybe occurs to, when you look at or read, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the this books like uh, Chocolate Cities or The Color Line, um, you know, when you look at uh, what our nation has done with respect to redlining practices and things of that nature and lending. And so, you know, in terms of many neighborhoods, especially the, the exclusive well-to-do neighborhoods where I live out here in Texas, um, they're, they're still largely segregated, right, um, by race, right, or, you know, and, and the idea is that to what degree are we still psychologically separated in our minds, this idea that only certain people can do certain things. And so when we see this rotating gyrosphere, the dinosaurs all around, the picture on the right is instructive because people had to see past this practical in order to, 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 to project this idea of what could be. And so the question is, to what degree do we do this when it comes to people of color in different roles. So congratulations, your training day is complete. <laughs> and I would just like to say in closing that um, one place where we all appear to be treated equally is at the box office. Hollywood will take our money the same, just, 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 as, just as they'll take yours as they'll take my, my money, just, just the same. But it appears to me, Dr. G, that even though we all pay the same price of admission, it is people of color, Blacks in particular, who disproportionately bear the cost of omission. My name is Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., author of Black Oscars, and now that you've had this Black author's experience, may you never see movies the same way again. Thank you. Wow. Was really great. That was really great. I think that you um, have definitely made me not look at movies again the same way. Uh, now I've been watching movies fervently since I was in high school. That's when I first developed my love of movies. And, you know, and over the years on certain some of my all-time favorite movies that I look at sometimes today and my outlook has changed on, on uh, what I got out of them at first. So, um, But I so think I, that's a good thing, Ron. I, I, I do because the, the fact of the matter is what we take out of the theater depends upon what we bring into the theater, right? And so, you know, as you grow older and have more experiences, you, you, what you bring into the theater changes in terms of what you take out of uh, out of the experience. And so hopefully what we did tonight was just provide, um, you know, our audience members with a couple additional things to think about in terms of going into the theater, because I think it's very much possible that we can see the same thing, but not see the same thing based upon the, the amount of preparation we have going into the theater. Oh, you, you're so you're so right. Because, you know, one of the things that I thought you were spot on about in your book was the observations of birth of a nation and uh, imitation of life, both versions. Because uh, I saw, I took a film class at uh, University of North Carolina in Greensboro. And the uh, professor told us that if we wanted extra credit, we could stay after class and watch some movies and then write a critique of them. Critique of them. And the first one he showed was the birth of a nation which I had never seen before. And of course it came with a warning from him. He, he, he kept saying that every time he showed that he was afraid that he was gonna get some protests 
for some of our local organizations, because mm -hmm. especially around during that time period, mm -hmm. the Klan was having public meetings and they were showing birth of a nation at those meetings. And this was back in the late 70s. That's correct, Ron. That's correct. They actually used that movie to recruit. That's how inflammatory it was. They used it to recruit. Exactly. And so I have to say, you know, uh, looking at it and you were seeing all these really innovative movie making techniques that were introduced, mm. but yet you want to clutch your heart at some of those scenes. I mean, I mean, I've only seen it just at once. I thought I just can't go through this again. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, you know, yeah. and the thing with the imitation of life, uh, which was, the 1959 version was one of my mother's favorite movies. I remember so many times sitting around the TV, all of us crying at the end when she starts beating on the coffin. And then I finally got a chance to see the 34 version some years later when I became an adult, the pancake version. And the first thing that came to my mind while watching that was, okay, she's been offered just a piddling amount to... But for her pancake recipe. 20%, you know, man. 20%. You know, like, yeah. And she's like, okay, I'm doing you a big favor. Uh, I'm going to offer you this. And the lady's like, oh, no, I want to stay here and help me. And I said, I, Gad's a mighty. Uh, you know, and sometimes these are the kind of films that some of the day, the modern day audiences just have trouble watching. And to a certain extent, the same thing with um, Imitation of Life with that. But Although, I don't know, that's, for some reason, I don't Ron, think I would, uh, I don't tell, think. say a little bit about the uh, plot of Imitation of Life for those who haven't uh, seen it. Oh, well, it's about a uh, African-American mother and her child who encounter a white mother and her child. And the white mother winds up, take, make a long story short, taking them in. And in the 1934 version, she has this great pancake recipe which Claudette Colbert decides to market, and then she offers her a, um, a percentage, a small percent. Anyway, but the whole, uh, the, the big gist of the of the story is though, is the African American lady has an extreme light skinned daughter who cannot come to terms of being black. She wants everything that she sees the white children getting, and this goes on throughout her time as an adult. She rejects her mother, and then. Um, the mother winds up uh, dying and she decides that she is so sorry that her mother is gone and she treated her the way that she did. And the 1959 version just carries it all a little bit further. Uh, it's not a pancake recipe involved, but the lady winds up becoming the, um, the maid and caretaker of the lady, uh, Lana Turner's daughter and uh, her own child. And interesting thing is they, well, in the 1934 version, they had an African-American actress, Freddie Washington, playing the role. Right. But in 1959, they had Susan Connor, a right. Jewish, uh, Jewish. Uh, right. actress. And, 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 and if I could just jump in. So, so here's what's fascinating, because, uh, well, A, I'm going to just say that here's a link in case anyone's interested. Um, a lot of people have been encouraging me to do some more uh, work on this. And so over the summer, when this, because I do teach it on the side, I'm a professor. So when the summer hits, I think I may do something. So if you're interested, please drop me an email at the landing site and we'll stay in touch. Secondly, I'm willing to stay after eight o'clock for a little bit um, in terms of if people still stimulated and have some questions, I can hang out for a little bit. And thirdly, I just to your point, Ron, that this is the point. When the, when the first version came out and the second version came out, Many were applauding it as an improvement. It, it was different. There, 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 were, there, there was a, 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 you know, arguably more agency of the black character. It wasn't quite as exploitative. But in retrospect, Ron, we look back and say, mm, it kind of sort of tastes like the same thing. It was just dressed up a lot better. And so that's what I'm challenging us to think about in terms of in the here and now. Like, Will it take us until the year 2051 to look back at some of these movies today and say, oh, wow, like we could have done better? Or can we start asking questions now about what's happening in 2021? Because remember, back then, you're right, the, the, the second imitation of life was still problematic in many ways, but at that time, it was viewed as an improvement. Yes, exactly. And you know, I think it's gonna take uh, a lot of, hopefully, improvement will come 
with the advent of, we seem to be having more African-American directors and a little bit more involvement. And I'm, I'm really pleased with the number of African-American women directors, because I think they also bring a great perspective on filmmaking sometimes. So I am hopeful. Yes. And I, and I as well, I mean, and so there's a couple of things that are different that were not there in 1939. And that is just the advent of Netflix, Hulu. There's more outlets by which more films are being made. There's an appetite. In fact, I think one of the, 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 the highest watched shows right now is Bridgerton on Netflix, which is obviously by a black writer, Sandra Rhimes. She left ABC. Yeah. You had mentioned a Ava DuVernay. You know, she's doing a lot of very powerful work, including the documentary 13th, if you haven't seen it, and if you're interested in history. So this is very encouraging. You know, still, though, my beef is with the Hollywood system, because when I look at the Issa Rae's of the world, she got her break only because she went through YouTube first. Right. And so I, I'm still very critical about Hollywood not making the investments necessary to open up these channels and spigots, because guess what happens when you open up the door? We increase the amount of options, choices, and dare I say, quality. The, the, the movie that won the movie of the year last year uh, by the, the Korean director was absolutely brilliant, right? And, oh and so, yeah, yeah, so this is what we've been missing all this time. And lo and behold, when you have more people in the room, when you have a more uh, multiplicity of voices and more diverse you know, uh, individuals in the room, all of a sudden you end up with different uh, storylines, magical, who would have thunk it? I, I think this is what is so long been in coming. Well, Hollywood seems to be so slow to change. And I think they could take a look at the publishing industry as an example. You know, all of a sudden they realize, hey, African-Americans read. <laughs> uh, you know, and so you, so you, all of, so you have an influx of authors of, uh, you know, of, I mean, we're representing all genres now and we have best-selling African-American authors and everything. And so I've always felt like the same thing with Hollywood, you know, that's something that we've been going doing from the get-go. We've been going to movies, even though we had to sit in the balcony. And, uh, you know, they've just been really slow uh, to come around to that. And of course, it all boils down to the bottom dollar. You know, Hollywood is very much a money-oriented industry. And, and Ron, you nailed it. I tell my classes all the time, Hollywood makes movies to make what? Money, right? It's not necessarily for art's sake, right? They're making movies. I mean, so th that's, my, that's my complaint with the help. This is not a documentary. This is a for-profit movie. This is a for-profit movie. So you're, 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 make, you're stylizing, you're making various editorial choices so the product can make money. And I think you're right that there's right now very little financial disincentive for Hollywood to amend its ways because the formula has been working for so long. What, what's the financial disincentive to change? Oh, well, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and I don't want to hog up everything because I once I start talking about movies, I can go on for hours. So if anyone out there has any questions, please uh, put them in the chat box. And while I'm waiting on that, I'll mention one other thing. Um, I was one of the people who saw Song of the South before oh. Disney put it in. Oh, put it in into, the, into the vault. Yes. Into the vault, right? Except I found out. That you can still it's you can still view it and you can also Japan. buy DVDs of it in Europe. Yeah, in Japan. Yeah, you're right. Overseas. Yeah. That's correct. because uh, I remember because uh, I was in uh, high school when I saw it and I was like, oh my okay. lord. And well, I right, still, I mean, I mean, just related to you, I remember my mother, she took me to the theater to see it as a child, right? You know, and, and, and the thing is, at that point in time, we were just fixated on the idea that there was a black face on screen. So Zippity Doo Dah was a household song. We used to love singing that song. We went to Disneyland, we went to Disney World, because, you know, Splash Mountain is uh, themed after, you right. know, Song of the South. And, you know, they, uh, you know, they changed it. Br'er Br Br Rabbit is not in a tar pit. He's in a honey pit. He's in a honey pit, not a, not a tar pit. But the idea is that, you know, we had nothing but nostalgic memories associated with that, not realizing the, the, the proximity and, and the positionality of Uncle Remus essentially being 
a slave on a plantation. And, 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 and when you learn about the horrors of enslavement, there, there's very little to sing about. <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, careful little song, but uh, that is yeah. factual. It's, it's the it's truth. Good. It's actual. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because uh, to be honest, I don't even like to listen to it to these days because uh, yeah. I bought a Phil Spector box set, and somehow I didn't know that he had actually produced a recording of it with um, this group called I think Bobby Sox and the Blue Jeans or something or another. Mm. And, I, and I was thinking like, oh my goodness, I still don't like this song even more, even though I like I love <laughs> Phil Spector. Well, you know, I, you know, I said another thing though, having to sep just to quickly, just having to separate the deeds of right. people who were so creative to talent, and right. they go out with these horrible things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and so, and here's the thing, to, to your point, Ron, so I, I get this argument all the time that, oh, Dr. G, aren't you a little harsh? Uh, after all, um, you know, Hattie McDaniel played her role with aplomb, you know, she, was subversive with her furtive eye movements and you know the way she delivered her dialogue, she played it made perfect, you know, uh, expertly. And so my response to that is, but you're telling me she played it made perfectly. That, that that's the issue. I, I'm not saying that she didn't have any acting chops. I'm saying it's a travesty that the 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 maid was the only cup that she was able to pour her acting talents into. Right? I mean, you know, I well, mean yeah, well, that's very unfortunate. Uh, I see that we, uh, I could go on a long time about that one too, uh, mm -hmm. because to me that's always very, because where we said that where she always said that she'd rather be paid to be a maid than to well, that's true. She did, that's right. She did. And the, what I always thought was very interesting, because I know she was criticized a lot, but uh, but that's how, I don't know, I mean, that's, that's another uh, program. Because <laughs> 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 you start looking at Lord knows, step and fetch it. But anyway, uh, there is a question. Uh, Ms. Page has one. Uh, Dr. Gooding, when you stated you are a professor in what field and do, oh, you were answered it, I see. Okay, well, I, I, can, I can just, you know, extrapolate, uh, expound a little bit. Um, so I am indeed a professor of African American history. I received my PhD in Georgetown University. And so I'm a historian, in fact. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, as a historian, I, I did most of my initial work early in my career on black federal workers, right? Because uh, uh, for anyone who knows, anyone who's African-American, you know the secret that just about every African-American you know has somebody in the family who has a government job, right? You know, government has been, um, you know, this uh, overlooked avenue for, um, you know, middle-class stability. Um, you know, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that when you look at um, in the advent of World War II, so many African Americans were taking on the dirtiest and most dangerous jobs. You know, government jobs were an entree that provided a you know, viable alternative by which African Americans were able to begin to access the American dream. Now, what I found in my research is that once they did obtain many of these jobs, they're still... Well, the, the ugly head of racism still reared his head with respect to promotion rates and also wages paid. But at the same time, it was like this citadel, it was like the safe haven from the, 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 the more discriminatory private sector. Because remember, a private business is technically free to run its business the way it wants. And so I technically can hire my, only my family members if I want to. Like think about Cake Boss. You know, the, you know, he hired, you know, his, his sisters, his brothers, his cousins. He doesn't have to really hire anybody if he doesn't want to. And so this idea that in the private sector, people literally are free to discriminate. So therefore, government has been a key source of African-American, um, you know, viability in this country. But that being said, when I was studying that, I was just struck by the image of the black worker. When, when I was looking at the, the various magazine um, you know, articles and newspaper pictures. I was just struck by this idea of the image, especially in contrast to Rosie DeRiveter, we can do it, right? In, in terms of the heroic image of, of you know, a white women now coming into the workplace um, because, you know, many white men went overseas to fight. And, and I was just struck by the paucity, by the dearth, by the lack of, you know, comparable, you know, heroic imagery of, of Blacks. And so this really got me thinking about, well, what is the image of, of African-Americans? And so that, that got me looking at, um, movies because um, as a historian, um, sometimes it's, 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 it's tough. I mean, if someone's really interested in your topic, it's awesome. But then otherwise it's like, 
people, you know, stifle yawns and their eyes glaze over when you tell them you're, you're a historian. So I wanted to meet people where they're at. And I know if people are doing anything, they may not be going to the libraries as much anymore, right? Which is something that we want to promote. But they may not be going to the libraries, but they definitely are going to the movie theaters or they're going to the movie theaters on their phones. You know, they can stream them now. And so I just figured, why not meet people where they're at in terms of bringing the history into the present day? Because many of the roles that you're looking at in terms of the subjugation, the obsequience, the subservience, the deference to white authority, all this is rooted, right, um, in, in many of these historical narratives as far as black people literally, literally needing to know their place. When you think about after enslavement, the black codes, you can look them up, were enacted in many of these Southern states to help maintain the social order. So you were free, but boy, you're not equal. Like, you know, I mean, it literally was, they, they came up with these black, with these laws of, you can't look me in the eye, that, that's, that's not proper etiquette. You know, uh, it's ridiculous. You can look them up, the black codes, but that, that's all part of this power and control dynamic in many ways that hasn't completely evaporated. Yes, it's been mitigated, and I think it has been ameliorated in many ways, but not completely evaporated. That's so true. And those, and you mentioned those codes. I, I had a chance to, I, I did some reading one time, which mentioned some of those things, and it's like, it's ridiculous. Yes. You know, and, and like the whole concept of separate but equal. Ha! Huh. <laughs> <laughs> that turned out to be totally ridiculous, too. You know, and my father was one of those folks who went to federal government when he came back from the Korean War, See. you know, and that provided us with the most comfortable life. We found out that most people in our family had right. experience. And uh, I mean, you know, of course, we weren't rich or anything, but, you know, uh, we got things and uh, right. we were never hungry. We were never hungry or anything. So because uh, no. uh, he actually he retired from there and uh, he always he said he loved his job. But like you said, as, as I look back, and I'm now I'm thinking about things that I overheard him talking about with my mother, it was not easy for him to get a promotion. Right, see? Uh, so Ron, you, so you, you, this, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So you, your, your family story is exactly what I'm talking about. How it was better, but the question is, was it the best? Right? right. You know, you know, so it's constantly like this dynamic. And just contrast that versus the open-ended uh, narrative we see often heralded with the Horatio Alger narrative, you know, as far as, you know, Jeff Be Be Bezos, there's no limit to what type of income he can make. You know, it's just open-ended. This is awesome. You know, Bill Gates, you know, you know, fill in the blanks. But meanwhile, with African-Americans, is this like, it was like this, you know, tension behind, it's a good government job, GGJ, it, it's, it's better than sweeping, um, you know, the, the streets. But at the same time, there's this literally this glass ceiling. I mean, you know, when you look at the government scale, the, 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 the salaries are set, right? So, I mean, in many ways, it's in contravention of the open-ended profit model uh, that, you know, we often see uh, heralded with the American dream. Exactly. Exactly. Wow, this has been just a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. G. Thank you, Ron. Well, you're welcome. I, got, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this, and we really have got to keep in touch, Dr. G. Okay. I'd love to talk with you some more. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, uh, sign off now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight to our program. Remember, the Greensboro Public Library is your library, uh, and we're here to serve you. We have so many books. Uh, and uh, other resources for you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, the wonderful resource of Canopy where you can stream some of the movies that are mentioned in Dr. G's book. And we have uh, copies of his book available at the library, or you can purchase these through uh, booksellers, um, uh, either here in our community at our wonderful Stubborn on Books, or at um, you know, the bookseller of your choice if you're not in Greensboro. So um, in the words of Martha Sebastian, uh, libraries are the root and fruit of the community. And we at the Greensboro Public Library believe that we are a conduit to destiny. And we hope that you will come and see us often. And thank you for attending the program tonight.
Yes, thanks, everyone.